Jay here for Stretford Paddock, and this is the Tier 1 Transfer Podcast. Joining me, as always, is my good friend, Ronaldo Brown. How are we doing? Kind of miss your white hoodie from yesterday. You kind of, like... kind of miss my white hoodie? <laughs> Why, what's wrong with this green one? I just think you look better in white. Oh, I appreciate your fashion input, and I'll be, uh, I'll be taking <laughs> your advice in future. Um, and we've got a special guest with us, as always. We've got Damesh Chef from Sky Sports. Damesh, thanks for coming back on the channel. Thank you very much for having me, Jay. Ronaldo, you all well? Yeah, we're good. I see Damash is wearing white. Are you happy with that? Exactly. He's got, <laughs> he's got the same haircut as well. <laughs> this guy, man. Do you know what I mean? I had to bring that into it. <laughs> this is what I have to pull with Damash. It's a real thing, you know. You shouldn't even be taking a mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get straight I know I'm sorry about it I apologise <laughs> we'll get straight into it um, at the time of recording this there's lots of reports that the young second bid by Manchester United could be imminent um, can you give us an update on what that bid could look like and whether you think Barcelona would be willing to accept it the way I see the situation look, let, let's be clear about it that the number one priority in this transfer window for Manchester United is central midfield and Frankie de Jong is the number one target. It just feels to me at the moment, it's a game of brinkmanship between Barcelona and Manchester United. Barcelona want to get the highest possible price they can. But Manchester United are also very well aware of the financial problems that Barcelona have got. So they don't want to go in too early in this transfer window. I know much to the angst of some Manchester United fans who are saying, let's get this deal done. But if you look at it from a Manchester United perspective, if they did it very, very quickly, chances are they'd have played into Barcelona's hands and paying them exactly what they want, which they don't feel is a reasonable price. On the flip side, I think Barcelona are well aware that Manchester United haven't made any signings in this transfer window so far, and they might think that Manchester United are desperate, hence why they're kind of standing firm on their price. When I say brinkmanship, it's going to come a time where there's going to have to be a compromise on both sides. Barcelona will probably have to come down in their valuation. United will probably have to move up on their valuation. But having said that, even though it's gone this far, the information that I'm getting is that United would be prepared to walk away from the deal if they don't get what they feel is a reasonable fee and a reasonable price for Frankie de Jong. But there's a growing belief that there's a willingness from all parties to get a deal done. There is a deal to be done because... Just by definition alone, they've gone this far and we're still talking about the fact that they're in talks, that there must be a willingness from all parties. Yes, we do want to get a deal done. Barcelona will always say the right things in public. We want Frankie de Jong to stay. The agents uh, surrounding the deal will probably say, look, Frankie de Jong is happy at Barcelona. Manchester United will remain tight-lipped publicly about the whole situation because they don't want to put their cards out on the table just yet because they don't want to influence the, the transfer fee in any way. So like I said, I think there's just various things going on behind the scenes. And if this deal gets done, I'm sure everyone, um, both clubs, will definitely be briefing that they said that they'll be happy with any kind of deal that happens. Yeah, I hope it does get done, because it does feel, I know it's only early days in the transfer window, but it does almost feel like it's turned into a little bit a little bit of a sound. Yeah, that's, that's one of my biggest well, concerns. I, yeah, my, sorry, go on, Ronaldo, go on. Now, one of my biggest concerns is United running out of time in terms of chasing De Jong and then not being able to either look for alternatives or balls to other areas. Because another player that United have been linked to and he's also reported on Sky that United have opened talks with is Anthony. And I'm wondering how that deal is progressing at the moment because it, it seemed like United were kind of looking at the, a, what a £40 million pound bid or something along them lines. Have you got any idea how that deal is progressing at the moment? What I would say about running out of time, I think Jay mentioned it there, we're only at about two weeks into the transfer window. I think what's been influenced in, in how United are perceived so far in this transfer window is what Liverpool and Manchester City have been doing. Would Manchester United fans on social media in particular be thinking, why are we not completing deals had City not sorted out Haaland and Liverpool sorted out Darwin Nunes so quickly. I think you've, there is mitigating circumstances with regard to United because, look, they've got a new manager. And Eric Ten Hag probably wants to have a look at what's in the squad as well. I mean, United fans like yourselves will say, he's not good enough, he's good enough, he should be getting rid of him, he should be signing him. The fact of the matter is, is 
history has shown in football, but particularly in the recent history of Manchester United, it is much easier to change a manager than it is to change players because managers you can pay off at a minimal cost, whereas players, well, I say minimal cost, of course, that there is a lot of um, um, compensation associated with them, but players, some of them who a manager might not like are on long-term contracts. And it's easy to say, right, let's just sell him. But in practice, how actually easy is that to do? So I think Ten Hag wants to look at what's at the squad first, but he's under no illusions. He knows how they performed last season and he's seen a number of players already leave the club. Look, Pogba's on his way to Juventus on a free transfer. Jesse Lingard's contract is up. He's out of the club now as well. Matic, Mata, Cavani, they've all left. So numbers-wise... I think United need to improve anyway, but they need to get that quality in as well. And I think Ten Hag will want to assess everything as well as bringing in players that he probably knows. And it brings me on to what Ronaldo said about Anthony. There seems to be a running theme, doesn't there, with regard to Manchester United's targets here. Frankie de Jong. Yes, he's at Barcelona, but who did he play under at Ajax? Eric Ten Hag. Anthony was a regular under Eric Ten Hag in the past couple of seasons. But the information that I've been given so far on that deal is, yes, there is a strong and a genuine interest. And United want to, you know, formally uh, put a bid in with Ajax and talk to Ajax. But I think that one also is a difficult one to do simply because Anthony is under a long-term contract at Ajax. Then you've got the likes of... Um, Urian Timber, who was linked with United. And I think there's a possibility that if we believe everything we, we hear, Louis van Gaal might have, of all people, might have scuppered that one because he said, look, you need to be playing regular first team football. But with regard to United, the defence is kind of like the lowest priority. But with Anthony, yes, definite genuine interest. I think midfield is number one priority and improving the forward line, not necessarily bringing in a number nine, but improving the forward line is, an, is, is, is priority number two. So Anthony would fit that bill. And it's someone that Eric Ten Hag knows very, very well. Do you believe that similarly to the way that the De Jong saga is going, that Anthony could end up being a little bit of a drawn out negotiation process rather than United getting it done fairly quickly? Because I actually recently set some quite high evaluations on some of their players because I don't, I didn't they have an agreement with Ten Hag that they didn't want their squad being decimated when he did come to United. So I feel like they are going to be quite hard to bargain with. Do they will be, but I mean, look, Eric Ten Hag has come in and he will want to work with players who he knows and he trusts. So it's, it's no real surprise that the Ajax link is going to be there because he wants to play in a particular way at United and he's going to need the players who are up to speed with his philosophy. So it's... It's no surprise that he, he is going back to his old club, but that's not to say that he's going to go back to his old, old club and, and sign six or seven players there. But there is obvious and genuine interest in Anthony and there is obvious and genuine interest and a bid, of course, with, with Frankie de Jong, who used to be at Ajax as well. Will it be a long, drawn-out saga? Define long, drawn-out saga. I, I think United privately probably are quite relaxed in, the, in that they are trying to do things the proper way. They are trying to take a step back this time and say, we need to do our business properly. We don't want to overpay. We are prepared to walk away from deals if we don't feel we're getting the right deal that's there for Manchester United. Now, fans will often look back and when they reflect on certain transfers that have been made at United, the argument has been, why did they rush into that one? Why didn't they take their time? But then by the same token, those same fans will criticise when United aren't making a move on and getting a, a transfer. So I don't think they can win in one way, but I think they're comfortable with how they are approaching this window. They've got their trust in John Murto to be able to do these deals. And he's doing it with um, a bit of, you know, data analysis strongly linked into every single purchase that they make to make sure that it's not just a signing that United fans will get excited about, but a signing that United fans will recognise will fit into the philosophy of the manager going forward. 
Um, you've sort of reported as well that a defender is is less of a priority for for Manchester United. You know, you've mentioned there other other areas they're looking at. Is that one of the re reasons behind the the timber deal? Stalling, or is is it because United are looking at other things, or is there, there are there other reasons that that's not that's not happened? If you believe what you read, I mean, Louis Van Gaal might have had a say in the Timber situation because he he actually said that you've got to be playing first team football regularly. Now the the issue with United at the moment, look, if you ask a lot of United fans, and I'm sure you're getting lots of um, tweets on your inbox. Um, Jay, Ronaldo, I'm sure you are about why they're not strengthening the defence. United's defence is not good enough. That's one way to look at it. But regardless of that, I think the reasoning behind the defence not being the number one priority is because of the numbers that exist there. It's not to say that they're not looking at defenders. They are. They are looking at the likes of Yuri and Timber. They are looking at the likes of Villarreal's Pau Torres, who they've been linked with before and who's been linked with a number of Premier League clubs as well. And look, he, he had a taste and a strong taste of Champions League football last season when Villarreal got to the semi-finals. Will that have an impact on if he was to move, where he would move to? United at this stage can't offer Champions League football. So would that have an impact on any potential incomings? But the fact of the matter is, now I'm not going to talk about the quality of Manchester United's defenders. All I can tell you is the facts, and that is the numbers that exist in that area. And you're already looking at Varane, Maguire, Phil Jones, Eric Bailly, and Victor Lindelof, five central defenders. Now, like I was saying earlier on, it's so easy to say, right, just get rid of two of them and bring in two others. So much easier said than done. These guys are under contract. And as much as United might think we want to offload a couple and bring a couple in, it's going to be up to the player as well. If they're under contract, they will hold the power. They don't need to go anywhere. So it will be up to the player. But if, if the manager says, look, you are not in my plans and they can get a deal done, then I think there is processes in place whereby United are looking at that position. All I'm saying is that central midfield is what I'm told is the number one priority. Um, improving the forward line is number two priority. And number three priority is the defence. But I think that comes down to numbers rather than anything else. Do you think that sort of killed that one then with Timber, the, the Van Gaal influence and the fact that, you know, coupled with the fact that obviously it's not a prior age, do you think that that one, the Timber to United doesn't look likely now? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, Manchester United fans must have been looking at uh, with dread at every single <laughs> Louis Van Gaal news conference, effectively telling Eric Ten Hag not to <laughs> take the manager's really. job. Yeah, <laughs> don't, yeah he's, he's not then, exactly selling us, is he, to the, to the no, Dutch contingent no, commercial um, club? Um, not happy about the way he left, maybe. And then um, maybe advising um, Yuri and Timber, look, if you're not going to get first team football, you're not going to be in my World Cup squad. And I think this is, I think the World Cup being in the middle of the season as well may influence certain players, not just coming to United, but at every club, simply because if they're in the squad now and they start the season with only four months to go and then find themselves out of the team that they're in, their World Cup place is at threat, isn't it? So it's a real, real conundrum for certain players and for clubs as well. On the flip side, the introduction of five substitutions next season, I think that could have an impact uh, certainly on how clubs do their business because whereas before you've got a 20-man squad going to every Premier League game and of the nine substitutes, you've got a three in nine chance of being called upon, whereas five substitutions, possibility that you could use all of them. And then that is another way that a manager can keep a big squad full of quality players a little bit more happy compared to if, if they've only can use three of those substitutions. And you'll find that some players are simply not getting enough action at all. I mean, Jesse Lingard is a case in point, isn't he? He came back from that West Ham loan spell the season before last and his stock was so high so high that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer effectively assured him he would be getting first team football. He would form a part of that squad for the following season. It just didn't happen for him. I wonder 
what would have happened had there been a five substitutions rule. I'm not saying that he'd still be at Manchester United, but would he have got more game time than he did last season? We might never know. Yeah, right. possibly. I mean, yeah, he made a few appearances, didn't he, as a yeah, sub as well? But like you say, especially after that loan spell at West Ham, it would have been interesting to see. I just think there was probably a little bit too many issues behind the scenes there with that one. But you have mentioned that United are prioritising midfield in the transfer window. And another midfielder that we have been linked to is Christian Eriksen. Is it basically just a situation now where he's deciding between Brentford and United and if you've got any indication of which way he might go? Yeah, so one of my colleagues is, is working closely on that story and um, they basically said that Ericsson is going to choose between Brentford and Manchester United. The United offer is financially more lucrative than the Brentford one, but I don't think um, Ericsson's decision will be strictly motivated on, on money. I think there are other issues at play here. On, on the positive side, on the Brentford side, They've had him, of course, for six months. Um, Ericsson was very, very thankful to Thomas Frank for giving him that opportunity when perhaps some other clubs might not have taken the risk. And, you know, if you ask a lot of Brentford fans, had he not joined when he did, some are actually saying they could have actually gone down. So he was quite pivotal in their, in their second half of that season, um, last season. On the flip side, United, yes, as I mentioned, financially more lucrative, but also there is a relationship there between Ericsson and Eric Ten Hag because Ericsson, when he was building up his fitness again after that horrendous moment when he, when he had that cardiac arrest at the Euros, when he was trying to get, you know, to train at other clubs, he went back to Ajax and he trained with the team at Ajax and Eric Ten Hag was the manager there. So I think that's... Um, can't be underestimated the, the relationship that will have been built up there. So I think it is a choice between those two clubs. It will be down to, to Christian Eriksen. But if, if United were to get Eriksen and De Jong and maybe an Anthony as well, and maybe if they were to bring in another defender, I think some of the detractors rather uh, over the past few weeks may just get turned. You never know. Um. Just, just sorry to go backwards a little bit, but you know, talking of defenders, you said maybe a, a defender, but do you have, is there any indication of which other defenders United may be looking at? Because I know we mentioned Timber, and that sort of looks like that it, that's not going to happen. Is there anyone you think that because we we we're hearing that there's the kid from uh, Feyenoord, the the left back, is it um, who we've been linked with? Uh, yeah, Malassia. Or something yeah, on. Malassia. There's one or two yeah. others. Is there anyone that you've seen that you think maybe could end up at Old Trafford? Well. <laughs> It's the theme that we've been following, isn't it? From, from the moment we started this podcast, Eric Ten Hag going for what he knows and what he trusts. And there's a definite interest in Lissandro Martinez as well from Ajax. Arsenal also very, very interested in him. Both clubs in the Europa League next season. So it will come down once again to the player. And you just think if United... Um, using the relationship potentially that Eric Ten Hag has with Lissandro Martinez. Could they be in pole position to try and sign him? But again, Ajax, um, you know, they don't want to lose all of their players and they don't want to lose them all to, to one club as well. Having said that, you've got to remember not only the link, of course, Eric Ten Hag and Ajax, but also the relationship generally that Ajax have with Manchester United. It is a very, very friendly one. If you go back a couple of summers when United signed Van der Beek, how often do you see a, a tweet from the selling club wishing the player well and saying that United is a great club and we hope you do really, really well? And I think it was almost the same kind of message that was sent when Ten Hag left Ajax um, as manager of Ajax to become the manager of Manchester United. And I think one of the key reasons for that is, is the Ajax chief executive, a certain Edwin van der Zaar, of course, a Manchester United legend and always had a, a really, really good relationship with Manchester United. And I think that has carried on with the clubs and the business that they do. So as much as Ajax will not want to sell all of their players and, and the players that we've been talking about, they want to keep hold of the likes of Anthony and the, the likes of Lissandro Martinez and, and Urien Timber, if United did come in for them and a deal could be agreed, I'm sure you would see that negotiations would be quite friendly between the two clubs. 
Yeah, we sort of uh, we didn't exactly do what it, what they asked when it came to looking after uh, Donny Van der Bay, did we? we no. <laughs> make <laughs> sure like you look after element. him. Well, yeah. I mean, you you mentioned that, Jay. I, I I think a lot of Manchester United fans are very very intrigued to see what happens now with Donny Van der Beek because Eric Ten Hag is there. Look, Donny Van der Beek was a central part of that team that got Ajax to that semi-finals in, in the Champions League when they were pipped by Tottenham in, the, in that remarkable game. And so Van der Beek in with Eric Ten Hag once again. If it doesn't work for Donny Van der Beek under Eric Ten Hag, then I think potentially he might not have a future at United. But I mean, you would expect, given the relationship that they share and given Van der Beek knows exactly how Ten Hag works and Ten Hag knows exactly how Van der Beek works. It's that old cliche. Could it be like a new signing for United? You never know. No. It could be, could be De Jong, Van der Beek and Ten Hag was, getting I, the band back together. Um, or, or even Antonio <laughs> yeah. Martinez. It looks like it could be basically a quarter <laughs> of the way there to Ajax side a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Hopefully we get the same success they had. Now we're going to um, touch on the keepers now because Dean Henderson looks like he's seemingly on the way to Forest. Why do you think United have opted for a loan rather than a straight-up sale? Yeah, this is an interesting one, actually, because the initial noises we were hearing on that deal was that it was a loan with an option for about £20 million. Now, that quickly changed to United were just pushing for a loan, a straight loan, whereas Forrest were pushing for that option, understandably, because if they get Dean Henderson and he performs really well and say they stay in the Premier League, and they've agreed an option price for an outstanding goalkeeper, look, and someone who's been capped by England for £20 million, I think there's only one winner in that situation, and that would be Forrest. I think what United wanted to do here, and by the way, the status of that deal is that we think that that is now agreed between the two clubs. We think that Henderson will be joining on a season-long loan and a straight loan, and that's all. And I think what United's thinking on this one is, is as follows. And you can see there's a bit of method behind this and you can see the reasoning for it. So say they allow Dean Henderson to go and he performs unbelievably well and they had an option for £20 million. If Dean Henderson has a fantastic season, wherever he is, and Manchester United choose to sell him next summer, he's not going to go for as little as £20 million. Let's be honest. His market value will have gone up. So I think what United want to do is this. Send him on loan to Forest. See how he does at Forest. Remember, only two seasons ago, Dean Henderson signed a five-year contract at United. He's under contract until 2025. So time is on United's side. They don't need to make big decisions about the permanent future of Dean Henderson at this moment in time. They don't need to do that. So they can afford, if they've chosen De Gea to be their number one next season, to allow Henderson to go. And if they say, right, you can go on loan for the season, and he performs fantastically well, one of two things can happen when he returns to United in the summer. If they decide, right, you perform brilliantly, you are going to be our number one next season. Still got two years left on his contract. Dean Henderson will be the Manchester United number one goalkeeper. Henderson's happy. United are happy. If he performs well and United still decide, do you know what? We still think De Gea is the guy. He's our number one. And we're going to allow you to leave, but on a permanent deal. And he's performed well during that season. I think his market value will be more than £20 million. So that's the kind of the calculated risk that Manchester United have taken by not allowing an option in that deal. There is the third option where if he goes to Nottingham Forest and has an absolute nightmare, concedes loads of goals, makes lots of mistakes, Nottingham Forest get relegated and then he comes back to United and his market value will not be very high. But I think Manchester United will have weighed all of that up, and it's almost a calculated risk, which sometimes you have to take in football. And I think United have decided, yes, they've got faith in Henderson performing well and maintaining his value when he returns to United, either playing at United next season or getting a big money move next summer. Yeah, it, it does kind of make sense to me, because he's still very young for a goalkeeper. And we've seen signs. He didn't have, obviously, he barely played last season, but... When, especially when he was on loan at Sheffield United, he, he had a great season, didn't he? So, uh, for once, I think that kind of makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think Damage, the intention been... was, wasn't it? I think Sorry? the intention was. I think the intention was Henderson was going to be the number one choice next season. Sorry, last season. Yeah. 
after so the Europa League final remember it finished and some were even speculating at the time David De Gea's last kick as a Manchester United player was a penalty that he had saved and United lost the Europa League final and there was a lot of uh, speculation that that was to be uh, David De Gea's last action in the United shirt and Dean Henderson for all the money was going to be the United number one the following season unfortunately for Henderson he contracted Covid just as the season was going to start and so David De Gea kept his place but not only did he keep his place he kept Henderson out of the team simply because he performed so well and so De Gea took that second opportunity that he had and stayed during the rest of the season and from what I can hear from a lot of United fans the only two players who kind of escaped any criticism from the performances last season were De Gea and Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, you guys have watched them a lot more than me. Yeah, um, I think De Gea was still a little bit patchy at times. I don't think it was quite a vintage David De Gea year, but certainly compared to some of his teammates, he was a lot better. And especially as you was, mentioned that. I think he was one of the best of a bad bunch. Yeah. Where it was um, I think... Dean Henderson caught COVID, didn't he, at one point? And I think that yeah. sort of setting back. And I think we just at the time recording, I think Fabrizio Romano, who's obviously been on Sky, has, has tweeted a, a here we go at um, Dean Henderson going to Forest. So that looks like it's definitely happening, um, which, you know, is exactly what you just said, to be fair. So, yeah, Dean Henderson, there you go. There's a bit of transfer business done, eh? I know your team, Who Henderson. needs signings when we can loan out goalkeepers? Well. <laughs> that'll, that'll get us winning titles. <laughs> um, Damish, as always it's been great uh, chatting to you um and you know hopefully next time we'll talk we've uh we'll have made a few signings and we'll look forward to ch speaking to you again soon as well yeah before you go Joe, let me ask you one question this is to you guys okay september the first okay united fans are worried at the moment okay where are these signings why are the club not signing anyone come september the first if you are to do a podcast and you look back on the transfer window, what would you view as a successful transfer window for Manchester United? Go on, Ronnie, you can go uh, first. What I'd view as a, would be probably two midfielders. I actually want, was edging towards a, a secondary striker, actually, rather than a winger. Right, okay. And possibly a fullback, but obviously that's that's a dream case scenario. That's a dream scenario, which probably wouldn't happen. But I think a successful, if I'm being realistic, would be two midfielders and a forward and a defender, which is four. Do you know what? I, I, <laughs> I want to be different, but you've pretty much said what I'm yeah. thinking. Definitely two midfielders. I think one midfielder isn't enough. We need some major surgery there, even without the ones we've lost, especially when, as you mentioned earlier, Damage, we've lost Pogba and Nemanja Matic. Um, so, yeah, at least two midfielders. I'd like to see us have someone on that right-hand side on that right-hand side of attack, I think we could do with another option there because I think sometimes we're playing the likes of Rashford and Lalanga there who don't play as well as they do on the left. Even Sancho, I think, I'm just, better. I'm just concerned the about the Ronaldo being the only out-and-out -out number nine at 38. Who would you go for? Who would you want as a striker? <sighs> there's not a whole lot of options out there, but there's there's, there's a few good young players in the likes of the, I know Bundesliga don't have the best translatability oh. in terms of forwards. Oh. So, especially initially. Buying from the Bundesliga. But... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I like the Scamacca from um, Sassolo from Syria, but yeah. I know Sy Italian players very rarely like coming here. But there's a few young strikers out there that don't necessarily have to be threatening Ronaldo, but it could Can actually be a bit of an option. To come in and do a, yeah. a bit of a job. Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to see us giving uh, someone, like you say, to rotate Ronaldo. But I'm with you. I think we need some. I think we need at least one fullback, and not two. Honestly, I think our fullback position. That's what people are forgetting about the fullback been thing. It's terrible That's what last mean, season. It's been a merry go round for a reason. I think, you know, Luke Shaw didn't quite, well, he didn't He didn't have uh, a very good season. Tellez wasn't up to it. The loads, question marks. And Wan Bissaka, his form fell off a cliff. So, yeah, I'll settle for four as well. Four signings. So, I'll tell you what, on the 1st of September, we'll speak to you again, Damish, and we'll see where, <laughs> see where we're at. What but, do you think? Where do you th I'll just put that question back to you. What do you think for United would constitute a good transfer window? I think that, I mean, to fill those priority positions would probably be the, the number one priority. I mean, central midfield, I think every United fan you speak to would say that that is where United need most surgery. So, and not just quality, they need numbers as well. You mentioned the players that have left along the forward line. I mean, the, the information that I've been given, there was all this talk about Darwin Nunes, wasn't there? 
And I think that United's uh, argument against that would have been, yes, they want um, like improvements along the forward line, but not necessarily a number nine. And so as much as may, they might have been interested, I don't think they were interested at the price that was being quoted to what would not have been the number one priority position. Just say that they, they, they'd bought Darwin Nunes. You're looking at 80, the thick end of 85 million pounds all in. United have got a budget as well, remember. They can't just spend 400 million pounds in a transfer window. So how much would Darwin Nunes have taken off the budget to a priority position? Would United fans have accepted signing Darwin Nunes, but not getting the number one priority in central midfield? It's a balancing act because could they have got Nunes and Frankie de Jong and fulfilled other positions that they wanted to fill? Difficult. Difficult. Right. It is difficult. We'll have to wait and see. We'll sounds, talk like, to, sounds like supporting We'll, we'll talk to you again on the 1st of September when we're sat here crying. And we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we haven't signed anyone, but we've managed to get rid of a few more players on loan. Um, Dames, uh, it's always a pleasure chatting to you. And we will chat again soon. Thanks for coming on the channel. No problem. No problem. My pleasure. So a big thanks to Damesh Seth from Sky Sports for coming on the podcast. Always great chatting to him. Told us a lot of sort of what we, we, we guessed and what we thought might be happening as well, didn't we? But it's quite interesting, especially the Lissandro Martinez thing. There could be a bit of movement in there. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm more intrigued to look at where Ericsson's going to end up because if it is between United and Brentford, us as United fans feel like it should be an easy option. It should be an easy choice, mm. especially if we can offer him a more lucrative deal. But the fact that he's kind of mulling over us and a relegation candidate side with all due respect to it. Yeah. I it's kind of concerning they about Apple. The chance, didn't they? And, it, and also, yeah. from what I'm reading as well, he's settled in London and you can't, you know, he's got a family, he's been through a lot, he's settled. Those are the sort of things that sometimes, you know, take priority over yeah. am I at a bigger or a better club or whatever. Anyway, we'll see where we end up. We'll see on September the 1st whether we have got those four or five signings that me and Ronnie were hoping for or whether it's been underwhelming. This has been the Tier 1 Transfer Podcast. Make sure you're checking out Ronaldo Brown, Ronaldo Brown 98 on all your socials. Is that right? Yeah, you know it better than me. Yes, I do. You can also find him <laughs> over on Steve's channel doing the XG files as well. So check him out there. You know where to find me, uh, Jay Martin. You know where to find Damage Seth. He's on Sky Sports every day. So make sure you are hitting like, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching.